so the slide, this is a computation we did uh, uh, in this review uh, with, um, with other people, including Damien, who was there yesterday. And we looked that to train GPT-3, uh, you needed the same energy budget that the brain would consume in a thousand years. But yesterday, Damien was even better because he looked at the even more state-of-the-art uh, neural network time, and this was like 20,000 years. So, but you see that from, from one year to another, it's like exponentially growing in terms of energy. So this is really a, a, a super important issue to solve. And our goal is really to go to hardware and to make specialized machines that would only do neural network because they physically implement a neural network and they do this using the physics of uh, the devices. So for this, there are many challenges. So the first challenge is simply that you need to have uh, devices that physically implement the functions that you want. And so uh, what do we want? So uh, to make a neural network can mean actually many things to many different people. So I would say that roughly there are two approaches. The first one I would call uh, AI inspired. So this is more like trying to have a mapping of what exists in the AI community. So software neural networks that do all these, um, these big models like GPT-3. So uh, doing that, but in hardware. And so there, the operations are actually quite simple. So uh, typically you would have nonlinear activation functions. So these layers in red connected by weighted sums where the weights are the synapsis weights, the memory of a network, okay? So this is really a, a AI inspired approach. And the other direction is to go towards something that is more complex than this, that I would call more brain inspired, where you have really a dynamics of the neurons. Like for instance, you would have uh, spikes, you would have oscillations and all kinds of things. Okay, uh, so I will talk about both, uh, but um, most of my talk would be about doing an AI inspired approach, okay? And so uh, we turn to nano devices so devices that we are like maybe tens of nanometers wide uh, to go to really uh, something that is as compact as possible. So here the idea is to have one physical nano devices which intrinsic physics replaces uh, the function that would be done by uh, a circuit, okay, an electronic circuit. Here you just have one device. Okay, but even when you have your devices that do this, you have challenges. The thing is that um, you cannot just uh, connect, you, you have to connect them into uh, deep networks, okay? So, and so here, um, really this is also because this is what you observe in state-of-the-art AI, that networks that can go to really complex tasks have many layers, it can be up to 100. And so you really need this hierarchical structure and it's actually inspired from the brain. So I don't know how much it is used in the brain. Uh, some people here would be more suited to answer, but really it seems at least that for application, you need this deep structure. So it means you need to be able to connect your devices into layers. And so if you have these nano devices, for us it means you need to be able to take the output of one device and feed it as an input <coughs> to the next device, and so on and so on. And uh, you need to also co-integrate them together. For instance, if you have a chip that you want to then put uh, on your smartphone or, uh, or a sensor, you need all of these different devices, the neurons and synapses, to go together on the same chip and to be able to feed each other. And this is actually uh, far from trivial. So if you look at what is being done, uh, in the field of doing nano neurons and nano synapses, uh, often what you will see is that you, you, you don't have really fully nano neural network. What you will see is that many people have done uh, nano synapses. So we have seen the, um, the memory stars with Damien. This is, I would say, the, the most used technology. So you would have these layers that do these weighted sums of nano synapses. And often they are connected together by something that is not nano. So either an external controller or some off the shelf component, but not by nano neurons. Then you have people who have developed nano neurons. And uh, what they show is nano synapses that connect 
two nanoneurons, and that's it. And also, the typically, the nanoneurons and nanosynapses are not the same technology. And the reason that they connect neuron to synapse and not synapse, uh, well, they connect synapse to neuron and not neuron to synapse, is that because usually what comes out of uh, nanoneurons is uh, not super um, easy to use. If you look at this trace, for instance, this is the current, like kind of spiky behavior that comes out of a nanoneuron. And actually, it's really hard to put this into a nanosynapse and still get your nice weighted sum. So uh, it's not easy to have nanoneurons that output you something that then you can use for the next computation. Okay. Then, third challenge, not only you need to have these connections in two layers, but these connections uh, need to be dense. So in the brain, we have uh, 10,000 uh, connections per neuron. This is huge. In AI, it's also in thousands. And so these connections, uh, they need to not be only short range, but also long range. They need to be very dense. And you need to be able to tune them to really uh, train the network. And so this is super, super hard to achieve uh, when you are in physical systems, because physical systems tend to naturally be uh, locally connected. For instance, um, in, uh, in my field of spintronics, there are many people who work on these spin ICs where you have nanomagnets uh, that are locally coupled by their dipolar fields. But you see that this is really local. Or you have people who work on the spin waves. So this can be a bit similar to things that are done in optics. You have really waves that interact. And you can tune the interaction, but it's really hard to have independent tuning of all the connections. Um, so for instance, uh, um, probably many of you have heard of the um, D-Wave machine, which is a quantum annealer. So here they have um, a, a spin qubits, superconducting spins. And <coughs> so they claim that they have 2,000 spins. But the thing is that because they are only locally coupled, if you try to really implement uh, an all-to-all -all coupling on it, you need to have some kind of redundancy. And then in the end, it's like you only have 50 spins. So really, having these all-to-all long-range connections in a physical system is extremely hard. So uh, I will tell you uh, a bit about how uh, radio frequency spintronic nano devices can uh, bring some answers to these challenges, because uh, you will see that they are um, devices that can implement neural function in a compact, uh, fast, and low power way. Uh, we have designed a modular architecture that can scale to deep network. And we have a way that uses uh, these radio frequency connections to have dense connections. And they have interesting nonlinear dynamics that we hope to harness to go to something more brain inspired. So uh, I will first introduce you to the physics of these devices and then tell you how we can use them. So do you have questions for now? Please interrupt me. Everyone good? OK. Maybe not yes? question, but what you said about how to connect uh, the nanoneuron uh, to the nanosynapses. Mm -hmm. You said that for the reshaping was maybe something that I, I Yes, know, yes, because <laughs> basically um, what you want from your layer of synapses is to do these linear weighted sums, right? Okay. And so it's not that easy to have uh, to keep this linearity if your output is all uh, all messed up, basically. So often, yeah, often people who have nanoneuron, the nanoneuron is, is the output and that's it. They don't really do anything with it anymore. Okay, so uh, spintronics means spin electronics, okay? So they are devices where we have interaction between uh, electrical uh, phenomenon and a magnetic phenomenon. And we can use that to uh, store, uh, manipulate, process information. Okay, so the device that is the kind of a flagship device, and that I will use in my talk, is called a magnetic tunnel junction. So it's a little uh, pillar. Okay, and you see, uh, it's it's like a sandwich of two magnetic layers and a tunnel barrier insulating in between. Okay, and so uh, with lithography, it can be made onto 
very tiny uh, pillars that are tens of um, tens or hundreds of nanometers. The record is a two nanometers, 2.3. I'm not sure what it means, 2.3 nanometers, but very so it can be really very small. And what is very interesting is that the electrical resistance depends on the magnetic state. So if you have two magnets, they can be either in the same direction or opposite direction, okay? And this would give you different electrical resistance. So it means that you can read the magnetic state electrically, okay? Um, but you can also write the magnetic state. You can manipulate electrically the magnetization. The way you do this, so there are many flavors and zoology of different phenomenon, but roughly speaking, you send the current to the device, and what happens is that the spins of the electron can couple to uh, the spin of the magnetization and influence it. It's a phenomenon called spin transfer, spin transfer torque, okay? And so you see, for instance, here, on this curve, you see when I apply a voltage, I can go uh, to a different resistance state, which means I have switched the magnets to go to this different state, okay? And uh, you see that we have this hysteresis. So it's, uh, it's non-volatile. So this is something nice. You can manipulate the state and uh, then it will stay, okay? Without energy supply. So people use this as a memory. But you can, you don't need to just do a memory. Uh, instead of just switching the state uh, one and zero like this, you can also induce uh, dynamics of a magnetization, okay? And so you can induce it electrically, and then you can also read it electrically because the magnetic state influences the resistance. Uh, and the frequencies of these devices are typically between tens of megahertz to tens of gigahertz, depending on the geometry. So <coughs> this is not as fast as optics, but it's already quite fast. And uh, one thing very nice about this device is that it's a mature technology, okay? Uh, so uh, this means that uh, for a few years already, the semiconductor uh, companies have integrated it in their process line. So you see here an example from Samsung the magnetic device is this little thing in the middle. So you have transistors, and then on top you have these devices. And this is already in commercial devices for memories, for embedded memories that you can buy. This costs like a few tens of uh, euros. And uh, so this is really something I can do. So the devices I will show in my talk are extremely similar to this. So it means that with small modification, this can be already, uh, this could be brought to market by the uh, semiconductor uh, industry. And uh, also a nice thing about these devices is that although they are nano, they are uh, actually, uh, it's purely physical phenomenon. You are not, you remember yesterday we saw with Damien that we are moving defects in the devices and stuff. Here is very different. We are just changing the magnetization. So this does not damage the device. So it's the you have a lot of endurance of a device. And also, because it's a purely physical phenomenon, it's actually well understood and well modeled. So you can have models that have some uh, qu uh, quantitative predictions. And so this is very nice for uh, the simulations and design and things like this. Okay. So uh, now I will show you uh, our recent work and we have on how to make uh, AI-inspired neural networks with these devices. Are there any questions on the proceeding? Okay. So uh, I will go into the detail, but the rough idea is that the same device will be neuron, well, the same type of device, okay? The same type of device will be neuron and synapse, okay? So you can have really one technology on chip that does both, which is very nice for the going to uh, market. And the device that does the neuron will be an behaving like an oscillator. You send, you will send a DC current to it. It will emit an RF signal, radio frequency signal, and the device, that, and it will do a nonlinear activation function. And then the devices that are synapses will receive this radio frequency signal 
and generate a DC voltage. So they act like the resonator and they will perform uh, weighted pulse. And so my point here is that I'm going to show you this with these spintronic devices, which I think have amazing advantages. But what you need is really oscillator and resonator. So this could be done with many types of devices. OK, so how do we do the so it's, it's, it's the same device, but it's, it's I mean, you, you have one neuron, one synapse, but they, they are really from the same uh, batch of fabrication. Oh, okay, yeah. But it's, it's well, yeah, you, have, you have two devices, but they are the same. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <coughs> so synapses. So uh, one thing that is key to understand is that our synapses are what we call radio frequency synapses by which I mean that the input that they take is a radio frequency signal, okay? So what happens is that I send my RF current through the device and there is an effect of resonance called a spin diode where basically what happens roughly, you send um, this oscillating current, okay? Remember the current influences the magnetization. So if you are at resonance, the magnetization will follow your current so magnetization oscillates, so resistance oscillates. So then you have oscillating current times oscillating resonance, oscillating resistance, and you can do the computation and you see that you get a continuous term, a DC term. So you get a DC voltage. And this is what you see on this measurement. I measure the DC voltage across my device, okay? And you see that depending on the frequency of the input, I can get a response at resonance. You see this typical resonance until a shape. And you see that the higher the input power, the larger my response, quite intuitive. And actually, I will show you in the next slide that the DC voltage, so the output, can be expressed as the input RF power times a weight that depends on the difference between the resonance frequency and the input frequency. So this is how we achieve a synapse with this device. So I show you that this is a, a synapse. So here you see, I measure at a fixed frequency here. And so if I measure voltage versus power, you see it will go up, up, up. And so you see the data is the dot and the line is the linear fit. So we have a multiplication. Here I have a positive slope, positive synaptic weight. Now I'm going to change the resonance frequency of the device. Now, up, it's above. And now, when I compute, when I measure voltage versus power, you see again, it's linear, but this time, negative slope. So now, again, multiplication with a negative synaptic weight. And if I tune um, continuously the resonance frequencies, I get different synaptic weights. And it's nice because they can be positive or negative, which is actually uh <coughs> <coughs> not the cases with other um, nano-synaptic technology. Okay, so we have a synapse. And uh, so why do we go through all this thing of having the input be radio frequency? Uh, this seems quite complicated and not brain inspired. Uh, well, there is a very good reason for that, is that it allows us to do frequency multiplexing. So this is a bit similar actually to what is done in optics. Uh, so one reaction that sometimes uh, uh, we get from this, this work is, oh, it's nice, it's uh, electronics, but it feels like optics. And uh, so basically, let's imagine we want to do this tiny connection, right? We have four inputs going to two outputs that then move on to a next layer or something. Um, so here what I do is that to implement a weighted sum, I have here four synapses, you see, okay? And so remember, the output of a synapse is a voltage, so that's the output of my multiplication. Now I want to do a weighted sum, so sum of multiplication. How do I sum voltages? It's very simple, I connect the devices in series, okay? So I connect them in series, and you see, what is important here is that every synapse is actually in a different frequency range. So the synapses are frequency selective. And then what I do is that I choose, uh, my, I have my input, so powers. So each uh, input is carried 
by a different radio frequency wave, and it has a different frequency that match the frequencies of a synapse. And so uh, this way, to uh, make a very crude approximation, and we can go into more detail, so to speak really roughly, each synapse will only rectify its input. Okay, and so you can do, you can then have one change for one weighted sum, another one for another weighted sum. And you see it's very nice because you take all the inputs, you sum them, and you send them to all the synapses, and everyone knows who they should be talking to, to speak roughly. <coughs> so it's quite different from the frequency multiplexing that you do in optics, because here it's really uh, about the connectivity. It's really about the frequency selectivity of the synapses. So a bit different. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So this is a very good question. So it depends. It depends basically on how um, what's your frequency range available. So uh, for instance, uh, uh, if you have uh, from a few tens of megahertz to uh, 20 gigahertz you can safely put uh, almost like thousand and then you would need to like stack arrays. And wha what we see is that <coughs> if, they are, if the frequencies are too close together, it's hard to independently tune the weight and your uh, accuracy uh, on your task are decreased. Okay, but for now we are very far from this. For now we are really in the lab doing little proof of concept. So uh, we have done the measurement with two synapses and two, uh, two inputs. So you see here two synapses, each has a resonance regime. And uh, here it was just uh, experimental result versus ideal operation. But it was really nice because it was the first time we had this really uh, in hardware uh, uh, Mac operation on RF signals with these nano devices. And so you need neurons that match to this, okay? So our neurons are the same devices, but you use them in the reverse mode. So this time you send the DC current and actually what happens is that this can induce self-sustained oscillation of a magnetization. So one way to see it is that if your magnetization is processing, you have damping, right? So it will slowly go back to its steady state. But through this speed transfer torque, the uh, current can act as an anti-dumping, which, which I have put in the wrong, the wrong way, I'm sorry, here the arrows are inverse. So the you dumping will bring you back, but anti-dumping takes you away. So if your current is high enough, you get this self-sustained oscillation. Okay, so this is a measurement. You see you have oscillation of a voltage, and uh, so you have a power, uh, an emission power. And uh, you see here, very important, the power depending on the current, so the emitted power, you see we have this nonlinear function. So this is how we say it's a neuron uh, in the sense of uh, AI inspired because uh, it has this nonlinear activation function, okay? And uh, what is also interesting is that the output is this RF signal, so it can be matched to the uh, synapses. So now we do a full network. So here we saw connection of one neuron to one synapse. So it's very simple, you send DC current, it emits RF, RF goes to synapse, it generates DC voltage. So here we measure the DC voltage versus the input current. And you see we have the nonlinear activation function of a neuron times a weight by the synapse that we can tune. So we have cascaded the operation. And you can do this then with two nano neurons to two nano synapses, that's the same thing. And so now that we were able to connect really this layer, we could make a tiny neural network. So here our interest was really to show this interlayer connection. Remember, we really solved this problem of connecting nano neurons to nano synapses, and to show to show that we had something that was multi-layered. Uh, <coughs> so really. I literally thought what is the smallest multi-layer neural network I can do. I came up with this. So you see here we have two inputs, okay? Uh, so RF inputs that go to two neurons. So you have two times two connections, so four synapses. 
synapse, and then it goes to one or two neurons, you have two synapses again, okay? And uh, so to show that it is, we really have this layer in the middle, we need to show that it can do something that is non-linear. Because if you only have um, linear connections, you cannot non-linearly separate inputs. So uh, here, so let's look in the middle. So here the task, basically, you have power, you have your two inputs, power one, power two. The task is this black line. And you want the output to be well separated by the black line. So the output, here it's the uh, RF power. So no output <coughs> zero blue, output red, okay? So these are simulation. Uh, so you see this is perfect, and this is a simple task. And the experiment, you see, is quite good also. For this task, it's perfect. For the others, you have some misspecified data point like here. But overall, uh, for this very simple task, the experiment network does pretty good. So this shows that you can really connect the layers. So, um, and this is very nice because it means that we have this way to connect nanoneurons to nanosynapses, to nanoneurons to nanosynapses, and so on. So this can really go to uh, a modular architecture that can scale to deep networks, okay? And uh, it's the same device for neurons and synapses, so this is also nice for co-integration. And <coughs> we have these radio frequency connections that enable us to do this multiplexing for dense connectivity. But you see, at every layer, we regenerate DC, right? So it's not a big uh, blob of RF. Uh, it's really modular, okay? R the RF connections are just within each layer. So we think that this is uh, really an architecture that can scale up to a large, deep, dense network. And uh, of course, we are working on a little proof of concept on chip where you have uh, semiconductor electronics and the magnetic devices. Okay, so but this was a very, very simple uh, task. So uh, we used simulation to see how it could go to larger things. And so here what we do is that, so in machine learning, there are many libraries. Uh, for instance, there is a Python library called PyTorch, which is widely used. And the nice thing with this library is that, so it allows you to, um, uh, build neural networks and train them, but you can really put whatever uh, functions you want for neurons and synapses. So we could put really the physical models of our devices with really all the, the spin diode curves of resonance and stuff, so really to, to test the, the physics. And so we have tried some uh, kind of standard architectures, like a multi-layer perception, for instance, so it means it's like what I showed in experiment, but just bigger or convolutional neural network. Um, so convolutions are very useful in machine learning and our architecture can be adapted to be optimized for convolution. I don't have time to show you here, but this is also something we can do. And we tried on the standard data set that is MNIST. And so uh, what is important is that we see that we can do as good as the normal software AI neural network. So this was kind of a validation of what or physical devices could do. And so uh, we tried also to compute how much energy it would consume. So these estimations are always really hard to do. You can really easily fall into worlds of over-optimism or over-pessimism. So <coughs> we tried to do it as well as we could, but this is always hard. So we found, okay, um, if we have a real system really the, the real system on the chip, where does the energy consumption come from? And so by discussing with our collaborators who are making the, the chip, uh, we identified that the main source of energy consumption, well, one, you need to really uh, feed the neurons so that they oscillate, right? So um, the neurons, they, they will need to, uh, they would consume energy. Okay, so this is one source. And then also the neuron, they emit RF, but it will probably not be enough to feed the synapses uh, directly if you have a very large network. So probably you will need some amplification here. And so we have done estimations, and so um, we estimate that the synapse will consume 10 femtojoules per operation, and the neuron 100 femtojoules per operation. Okay, so this is with scaled-on MTJ, but not going to something crazy, going to things that exist. 
And uh, so for instance, if you take the, the computation tree and the convolutional neural network using a standard architecture, it would uh, consume, um, uh, even being quite conservative, way less than a watt, way less than a microsecond, and way less than a microjoule. And uh, on the GPU, this same um, network would consume on this task one millijoule. So we really see that you could have a, a big improvement. And so this, um, these numbers, they are really comparable uh, to what is in optics or memory stick technologies. So uh, the advantage of Spiltronic here is really that it's super compact. They are reliable devices, they are small, uh, they can be integrated in the CMOS and also a multiplex architecture that we think can really help the, the scale up. Okay, are there questions on this? Mm -hmm. Okay, I will, I will take, uh, I will speak about it now. So for here we really did some simple uh, um, training on the computer and setting the weights, so just something small. So how much time do I have left? Fifteen minutes for it? Oh, okay. Oh, I have plenty of time. Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, okay, it's something very stupid. Basically, here what you would need is just something that converts uh, voltage to current, uh, like an amplifier, like an amplifier. And our focus was not doing that because we're, you know, it's physics lab and stuff. So we just measure the voltage and send an instruction to the current source with a computer. But for the MNIST, it's simulation. Ah. The MNIST is simulation. So here is just because really the, the computer is doing the amplifier and uh, the MNIST is, uh, this is simulation in PyTorch with a physical models. <coughs> okay, so here uh, I have shown you something that was really uh, mapping the inference, so really neuron synapse, neuron synapse doing the operation. But we want to go further. So we had a great segue question about how does the learning happen? So um, AI neural network are trained with back propagation. Uh, and the thing is that this is actually really hard to do on chip in hardware for several reasons. One, Okay, you build your hardware neural network. Okay, so you have one circuit. Then to do backpropagation, it means you need to compute gradients of every layers backward, right? So then you need another circuit that computes the gradients, something that stores the gradients, and then another circuit that goes and programs your weights. So by the time you do this, actually maybe you save energy on your neural network, but you have a giant circuit around it doing the learning and it's not efficient. And also um, doing this is hard because um, backpropagation is very non-local. So it means that to modify this weight here, I need to know all what happens in the rest of the network, especially what happens at the output. So this is not very nice for um, doing it on chip and also, uh, you know the nano devices, we've seen it uh, with Damien yesterday, they have uh, often a lot of problems, okay? They, uh, you want to make them all the same on the chip, and actually they are not. Uh, they sometimes have issues with time and stuff, so even if the industry optimizes them, they will never be as perfect as just like, uh, you know, numbers in a computer. And what we see is that all these problems really decrease the accuracy uh, of backpropagation. So this is really a problem. And uh, it's frustrating because so um, we have the backpropagation that is really state of the art for AI on complex tasks. So everything you see this chat GP3 and, and stuff with backpropagation, but it's not hardware friendly. And on the other side, if we look at really what comes more from the brain, uh, we see that the learning rules uh, don't really see to be the same, so um, 
uh, we have these brain-inspired rules that are much more local, that are much more hardware-friendly because, of course, it's in the brain. So, uh, for instance, you will you you have um, some of you know like this spike time-independent plasticity. So, one synapse will only be modified by the activities of the neurons around it. Things so things are local. Things are much more reliable to uh, defects and liabilities. Things are um, more tolerant to errors. Uh, but they uh, tend to be really uh, less performant when you go to hard task. So for instance, you see on this graph, you see the accuracy on different data sets. So M list is the digits, then C far is some little images, ImageNet is a big data set. And so these are more like, um, more like neuro inspired rules or things alternative that are much more hardware friendly. And the accuracy really decreases. And it's really just a back propagation that stays up. And my new, this is now in modern AI, this is considered an easy task. This is now like a, a test. So it's really frustrating. And um, actually, there's really now this big push in uh, AI and computational neuroscience to try to really merge the best of both worlds, OK? Um, to try and have algorithm that work as well as backpropagation. And people think that the big thing in backpropagation is that it minimizes this error at the output. So it really minimizes your error on your task that you're trying to do, but still have all these advantages of these neuro-inspired rules, OK? Yeah, there are even some people who say that the brain must be doing some kind of backpropagation, some kind of approximation of it, since this is what works so well and the brain works, OK? But uh, this is speculation. This is uh, Jeff Hinton who, who says that maybe this is the case. <coughs> <coughs> but my point is that really there is a convergence of uh, challenges and um, an interest of uh, people who are trying to make neuroscience plausible rules that could really happen in the brain and people uh, like me who are trying to make rules that work for hardware systems. Because uh, you know the neurons, they are variable, they are stochastic, and so on. So many of the problems in the brain are the same problems in the hardware. So there is really this, this convergence, and I think this is uh, so very uh, very exciting. So uh, really, our, our goal is to go towards these uh, systems that can do this self-learning. So by self-learning, I mean a system that can by itself uh, compute uh, the way that the weights should be modified and modified by themselves. That really learns by itself. And the, the dream would really have to, be, to have a system that does this using the, its dynamics, its physics, OK? Uh, that could compute approximation of a gradient somehow and then update its weights. And there are actually uh, many proposals uh, uh, coming both from more uh, computational neuroscience or more from physics of algorithms that could do this, OK? Uh, and uh, for instance, uh, one very famous is called this equilibrium propagation, okay, proposed by Cellier and Benzio. And uh, for instance, uh, in, uh, in our team, there has been some little work on proposal of how to implement this uh, with Spike and other stuff. So, but these are all really proposals. There is really not much done experimentally. This is really a beginning field. But I think it's extremely exciting because this is some place where you can really take uh, advantage of the physics of the device. Um, maybe it's exciting because I'm a physicist, but I think it's exciting. <laughs> and so really, uh, so and go beyond this AI inspired and really use dynamics to go towards something more brain inspired. And Spintronic devices really have a potential for this because actually they have this really rich nonlinear physics. Okay, so uh, this oscillator, remember, they are highly nonlinear meaning that power and frequency uh, can couple to each other. Uh, you have this transient dynamics with history effects. For instance, here, this is on the top an input to the device, OK? And you see then the response of the device, uh, the, uh, of, the, um, of the emission uh, amplitude. And you see that it's, uh, you have really this transient, so you can excite interesting things. Actually, uh, in our team, there had been work on how to use this for a reservoir, okay, with one device is emulating. And uh, so reservoir is a, 
a spin virtual and uh, showing that you could use this transient dynamics to classify spoken digits, okay? And uh, other rich uh, physics, so they are nonlinear oscillators, so they can exhibit synchronization. And this is very interesting because uh, many people uh, suggest that in, um, in the brain, uh, the synchronization of neurons may be some, some key part of computing and learning and forming memories. <coughs> <coughs> so these uh, synchronic oscillators, they can actually synchronize, so both uh, either to an external source or also to have mutual synchronization to each other. So uh, again, in the team, uh, there have been some work where uh, you, uh, you use this synchronization to do some uh, small computing. So you see here, for instance, you have three oscillators, and when you couple them, they all synchronize at the same frequency. This is mutual synchronization. And uh, so there was some work on uh, classifying uh, vowels using the synchronization pattern for, um, for computing. And uh, also, so this is not radio frequency, but there are also other dynamics that you can excite in the devices. For instance, you can excite uh, stochastic behavior, okay? So remember I told you the device has two states and they are stable memories, but if you fabricate it slightly differently, they are not stable, they just go back and forth like this, so it's stochastic. And it's interesting because it reminds us of stochastic uh, spikes emitted by neurons, and actually you can tune the rate of these spikes so it's like a t you can have like a tuning curve, okay? And uh, there are also uh, work uh, on how to make these devices emit unitary spikes. So the magnetization would just be one turn, one turn, right? It's like, like this. So there's really a lot of rich physics in these devices, but it is not clear yet how do we use it to go to computing uh, with something that is more than this tiny task and really goes to a uh, complex task. So really we need to have some way to merge the dynamics. So for us it's nice because this device, as I told you, they are well modeled, okay? So we can really understand the dynamics. So we need to merge this with scalable architecture that can go to dense deep network with the algorithm for learning that are adapted uh, so that they can really take advantage of our dynamics, but also accommodate for its limitation, for all the constraints of the nano devices. So this really requires some co-design of the hardware and the algorithm. So it's very multi-perry uh, work. So in our team, we have people who are doing algorithm, people who are doing device physics, people who are optimizing the materials, and everyone works together. So, uh, Really our hope, dream, is to go towards this deep dynamical RF spintronics neural network. So uh, to sum up my messages, so making hardware neural networks will make uh, AI more energy efficient. The radio frequency spintronic devices can make neuron and synapses fun. <coughs> <coughs> they are very promising technology. We have a small proof of concept of a fully a nano spintronic neural network with a proposal for a scalable architecture. And we think that going towards system that really harness the dynamics of a device will unlock uh, on chip learning. And uh, really this, these devices have a rich physics that I think is a super interesting platform uh, to go uh, towards this. Uh, so uh, I hope this has interested you and we are hiring. So if you know people interested, Please, uh, I, think, I think no one here is looking for a PhD or postdoc, but if you know people, come to me and uh, thank you for your attention. Actually, we are working on this. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes. So yes, indeed. So actually, you know, so Damien, who was yesterday, is really big expert on hardware uh, uh, binary neural network. And uh, yes, so we work on this. I mean, 
Yes, we are exploring both paths. It seems that you could do both with uh, other technologies. Okay, so it's not a question of in which direction to go. Ah. It's, it's just that if you send an RF signal at resonance, you will have this rectification of signal, this continuous path. And if you send um, a large enough DC signal, you will get RF emission. So it's not a question of in which way. I mean, if this doesn't matter, it will just change the polarity. Uh, Okay, that's a very good question. So uh, there are many different ways to do it. So, um, so this device is actually one way if you want to go binary. It's quite simple is that you can just actually, uh, basically it's like reversing a layer and then it oscillates like this or like this and it's slightly different. So this can do a binary way. Uh, another way is uh, to uh, have on top of a magnetic layer an oxide and okay, this is a bit technical, but basically uh, when you um, apply voltage to the oxide, you can make it that it has some interfacial effect with the magnetic layer and it changes the aniso magnetic anisotropy and this changes the resonance frequency. And this is, yes, 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 but it's, then it adds this layer of oxide that is, can have some same issues as a memory source. Because then this is not a purely physical phenomenon. So, so there are pros and cons to uh, So there are two different works. Um, so first, okay, I am not neuroscientist, so what we get is really, uh, you know, of, uh, um, so here there are two things. One thing is uh, you have different neurons and they can have synchronization. And um, basically, depending on what input they receive and how they are coupled to each other, they can they have different synchronization pattern, like one and two are synchronized to source A or something like that. And we can say every pattern is one class. And so you look at the synchronization pattern and that gives you the, the response. <coughs> In the mutual, it's a bit similar. It's more that you, you were, were sending them different currents and they can synchronize. It's like some, it was like, a, it's like they, they were like sending, um, it's a bit like binding events, so it might be a bit sim more similar to neuroscience. But really, if you understood, you see actually um, all these works were done before what I showed today about the, the fully layer, because this was really trying to put together building blocks with some inspiration of neuroscience <coughs> to do some kind of computing. But there is no really um, computing paradigm that scales up. It's more uh, tiny things. So at first we did these things, then we're like, okay, we need to have something that is more scalable. We went to the more this AI inspired approach. And now we are trying to kind of bridge back and see how can we use this interesting dynamics and still do interesting tasks. But, uh, but yes, I mean, there are, there are, because there are many algorithms that use oscillations um, in a more like Hopfield like ways. I mean, there, there are many, many different flavors of algorithm but none of them really seem to scale up. So, 
I mean, we are, I mean, we are the first to be interested in how do you do computing with synchronization. Uh, this is really open. Uh. Mm -hmm. Any other, uh, any other questions? So it's not a fancy game. <laughs>